my name is Tammy Bailey Stanton. I'm a specialist emergency physician at uh, Rahima Musa Mother and Child Hospital, and I work in the emergency department there. I'm also a lecturer at the University of the Witwatersrand, um, and I lecture in the Division of Emergency Medicine. I might meet some of you guys when you've visited us in the emergency department at Rahima or Helen Joseph or at any of your pre-hospital rotations. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about pediatric resuscitation and it is part one in uh, the lectures um, and I'll be doing part two at another stage um, around the corner. Um, thank you for joining me today. Okay, bye. This is the roadmap for the topics that are going to be covered in this tutorial, Pediatric Resuscitation Part 1. I'm going to give you a moment to look over these topics so that you can familiarize yourself with what's coming in this talk. The first part in any resuscitation is for the rescuer to ascertain if there's any hazards and to ensure that it is safe to approach the patient. This implies looking for any environmental or biological hazard and taking adequate precautionary measures. In 2021, it's impossible to give a talk on pediatric resuscitation without mentioning COVID-19. In these times, it's important to consider any patient, any child as a patient under investigation. It comes as no surprise that our 2021 cardiac arrest algorithms have been updated to reflect the current pandemic. The algorithms for layperson CPR and healthcare provider CPR have been updated to include extra steps that need to be taken to reduce the risk of transmission of COVID-19. For the layperson, this means using any available PPE in your house, this might mean a cloth mask or another mask. It also means avoiding mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilations. This algorithm is the advanced cardiac arrest algorithm for suspected communicable disease, but particularly respiratory communicable diseases, which means it's the cardiac arrest algorithm for COVID-19. So when you are a healthcare provider attending to a patient with suspected communicable disease, it's important to wear adequate PPE CPR is a high-risk aerosolizing procedure and the healthcare provider must wear appropriate full PPE for CPR. Donning appropriate PPE is not the only thing for a healthcare provider to do when faced with a patient with a suspected communicable disease. The healthcare provider also needs to consider the appropriateness of doing CPR for the patient in front of them. Ask about existing, do not actively resuscitate orders. We also need to be cognizant that in the height of a pandemic, when demand completely outstrips available resources or supply, it might not be appropriate to do CPR at all. There are times when CPR is futile. This touches on biomedical ethics, which is beyond the scope of this tutorial. For general patient interactions, we need to adhere to the minimum standard precautions. This means wearing a water-resistant surgical face mask and gloves. When performing aerosol generating procedures, we need to wear adequate PPE, which is more, which involves adequate eye protection in the form of goggles or a visor, an N95 or equivalent face mask, and a long sleeve fluid repellent gown or overall. Basic airway maneuvers, advanced airway maneuvers, bag mask ventilation, CPR, all of these are aerosolizing procedures. So it's important to look after yourself, your colleagues, your teammates, and other patients around you. Safety comes first. Now that we've made sure that we're safe for every single pediatric resuscitation, we can move on to the psychology of pediatric resuscitation. Most healthcare providers feel completely out of their depth when faced with small children or infants. A pediatric resuscitation may be incredibly daunting. The Zero Point Survey, as described by Chris Reed, focuses on the internal preparation that you can do before you start a resuscitation. 
As a healthcare provider, you need to make sure that you continuously update your knowledge and skills, ensuring that we're in the right frame of mind before any shift or any resuscitation is very important. It's vital to be prepared and to know your equipment. When we have an unfamiliar environment, which is often the case, it's important to practice active situational awareness. And this helps overcome problems uh, associated with environment. Other important factors when going into a pediatric resuscitation is to have excellent communication with your teammates as well as family members or the caregivers. And teamwork is very important. We need to embody the resuscitation mindset in any emergency setting, but even more so when facing children. Many textbooks tell us that children are not just little adults. We are taught how children are so very different from adults. We learn about their physiology and their anatomy and how it differs from adults. And this is particularly resonant for neonates. And in my opinion, neonates are much more like little aliens than humans. Um, but jokes aside, despite this, I believe that there are way more similarities than differences when looking at kids and looking at adults. A baby elephant, after all, is more similar to an adult elephant than anything else in the animal kingdom. A baby elephant is just a small elephant. There's no need to be intimidated when faced with children, because after all, kids are just small people. So what are some of the main differences in CPR for kids? There are just a few major differences when we're looking at resuscitation for kids and resuscitation for adults. And I'm gonna focus on a few of the more important differences. When we look at compressions for adults versus compressions for kids, there is a difference. If we are a team, so we've got two providers or more, we'll look at a compression to ventilation ratio of 15 to two. However, if we're a single provider, we'll still go with a compression to ventilation ratio of 30 to two. Ventilation rates for kids are different from ventilation rates in adults. Whether it's rescue ventilations or ventilations during continuous CPR with an advanced airway in place, we'll look at a ventilatory rate of one breath every two to three seconds, which is 20 to 30 ventilations per minute. The dosing of medication is also different for kids. For example, the dose of adrenaline for an adult, any adult in a resuscitation is one milligram, um, regardless of their weight. But in a kid, we'll use a dose of 0 0.01 milligram per kg for, of adrenaline. And this points to us making sure that we're using the correct doses for kids because medication doses for kids is based on weight. The energy dose for defibrillation is also different for kids. Um, if you've got an AED, you'll use an AED with a pediatric dose attenuator. If not, then you'll use the adult, uh, the adult pads. If we've got a manual defibrillator, we'll use a dose of two to four joules per kg. I'm sure you've asked yourself why are there so many different algorithms? In pediatric resuscitation, we've got lots of different guidelines and many different algorithms. The International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, or ILCO, is comprised of all the resuscitation councils around the world, including our own, the Resuscitation Council of Southern Africa. Together with a bunch of really smart people, they've come up with a number of guidelines called the COSTAR Guidelines, which stands for Consensus on Science with Treatment Recommendations. I'm going to let this next video explain ILCOR, the science of resuscitation, levels of evidence and COSTAR guidelines a little bit more. The International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, or ILCOR, created a collaborative forum for resuscitation councils worldwide to review and publish the science and treatment recommendations that guide the development of publishing consensus on science statements with treatment recommendations. 
Through a process of evidence evaluation, Ilcor reached consensus on international resuscitation guidelines in 2000 and on science and treatment recommendations in 2005, 2010, and 2015. Going forward, Ilcor will pursue its vision to save more lives globally through resuscitation. Its mission is to promote, disseminate, and advocate international implementation of evidence-informed resuscitation and first aid using transparent evaluation and consensus summary of scientific data. ILCOR uses a group of experts called Task Forces, ALS, BLS, EIT, First Aid, PLS, and NLS to review the relevant scientific questions from 2005 through 2015 and categorize based on relevance and prioritize these questions based on new science. A PICO is formatted with four elements, where P is population, a unique patient group such as in-hospital cardiac arrest patients, I is intervention and includes the main intervention or prognostic factor or exposure. C is the comparator group, such as those who received standard therapy. And O is outcome, that is deemed important and relevant. The PICO is then subjected to a process of systematic review, analysis using grade, and the resulting summary of evidence is sent to the ILCOR task forces to develop and post a consensus on science and treatment recommendation. The Science Advisory Committee overseeing the process has lumped all questions into domains that employ a similar search strategy. ILCOR information specialists are developing publication alerts specific to the domain to enable a domain leader to monitor the resuscitation science literature. When new science is published with potential impact, the domain lead, in collaboration with the relevant task force or forces, will activate evidence evaluation process. A simple PICO is then assigned to an expert systematic reviewer. A complex or mega PICO that consists of four to five related PICOs or a very broad PICO with multiple subgroup evaluations will be assigned to a Knowledge Synthesis Unit or KSU. The output is the generation of a draft consensus on science. The task forces then review it and develop accompanying treatment recommendations, resulting in a co-star. Each updated ILCOR co-star is published on the ILCOR website for public review and comments. Dialogue with the broader community is valued. Each systematic review will be published and linked to the co-star. To learn more, visit us at www.ilcor.org or email us at ilcor@heart.org. The full pediatric CoStar document from ILCO is 45 pages long. It describes in detail the levels of evidence behind the treatment recommendations. The executive summary is 26 pages long, with only four pages dedicated to pediatric basic and advanced life support. This is the link to the executive summary from ILCO. I'm now going to chat about some of the science updates in the 2020 guidelines. Amongst the ILCOR science reviewers, there's no consensus on the introductory sequence for CPR. We know that the majority of pediatric cardiac arrests are primarily as a result of respiratory failure and subsequent respiratory rest. Should we be doing CAB or ABC? Should we be doing compressions first or ventilations first? This is where you find differences between the American and European resuscitation councils. And it's why you might find differences between PALS, which is American based, and APLS, which is European based. The reason for these differences is because the two resuscitation councils have chosen to interpret the signs from ILCO differently. AHA recommends starting with compressions first and then moving on to ventilations, whereas the European Resuscitation Council recommends doing five rescue breaths and only then moving on to checking uh, compressions. There are good arguments to start with compressions first, and there's good arguments to start with ventilations first. The reason for starting compressions first in children is because it's consistent in what we do with adult resuscitation. This makes it easier to remember the CAB sequence. 
There's also very good arguments to starting with ventilations first. We know that most cardiac arrests in kids are due to respiratory conditions, respiratory failure. So starting with ventilations is really important because ventilations are so important in contributing to cardiac arrest in children. So the jury is still out with regards to the correct sequence of CPR and the 2020 ILCOR science team still can't make a definitive recommendation on which sequence is preferred. This is because there's no definitive evidence one way or the other and equally good arguments for CAB versus ABC. In South Africa, we've chosen to stick with the CAB sequence as the delay to ventilations is minimal when we use this uh, approach. It also helps us with the ease of teaching and the ease of memory recall because we use CAB for adults as well. The main thing in a pediatric cardiac arrest is just to start CPR. Um, so starting with compressions is great, but we do need to remember that we must perform ventilations. Unlike adult CPR, where compressions only CPR is adequate, especially in the first few minutes, children do require ventilations during cardiac arrest. So we'll consider compressions only CPR if we're not able to safely administer ventilations or rescue breaths for the patient. For infants and children with a pulse, but absent or inadequate respiratory effort, we need to give one breath every two to three seconds, which means 20 to 30 breaths per minute. One of the major changes in the 2020 ILCOR guidelines is the pediatric ventilation rate with advanced airway during CPR. This recommendation is based on a study that in found, found improved outcomes when the ventilatory rates were higher than the usual 12 to 20 breaths per minute, which used to be previously recommended. So the subsequent recommendation is to do higher ventilatory rates during CPR when there's an advanced airway in children. So the recommendation now is during CPR with an advanced airway, target respiratory rate of one breath every two to three seconds, which is 20 to 30 breaths per minute, accounting for age and the clinical condition of the patient. Rates exceeding this range may compromise hemodynamics and cerebral perfusion. The 2020 ILCO guidelines reiterate the importance of high quality CPR. The next video is of the Red Bull Racing Team. This team holds the current world record for the fastest pit stop with a time of 1.82 seconds and it was performed in 2019 at the Brazilian Grand Prix. I'm sure you'll agree the precision and speed at which each team member performs their task is inspiring. This teamwork and display of skill is something for us as healthcare providers to aspire to. This concept leads us on to the main focus of pediatric resuscitation, which is high quality CPR. The 2021 ILCOR guidelines reiterate the importance of high quality CPR. Advanced life support interventions are pointless if basic life support interventions are inadequate. High quality compressions are vital to excellent BLS. There are five components of high quality compressions. The rate of compressions for infants and children is 100 to 120 compressions per minute. The depth of compressions is 4 to 5 centimeters, 4 centimeters in infants and 5 centimeters in children. Release is important. Allowing for full chest recoil is important for adequate ventricular filling and coronary perfusion. Compression should ideally be uninterrupted. 
Minimizing interruptions in compressions should at least be the aim during CPR. The use of feedback methods to improve the quality of CPR is also encouraged. The recommendations continue in the new guidelines because scientific studies continue to link high-quality CPR to ROSC. High-quality chest compressions maintain blood flow to vital organs, especially the heart and brain. One way to measure the effectiveness of chest compressions is with coronary perfusion pressure. Coronary perfusion pressure is the difference between the pressure in the aorta at the end of ventricular relaxation or the aortic end diastolic pressure and the pressure in the right atrium or the right atrial end diastolic pressure at the same time. The higher the coronary perfusion pressure during CPR, the better the survival rate for the patients. As chest compressions begin, it takes several compressions to raise the coronary perfusion pressure to a level adequate to supply blood to the brain and heart. When rescuers interrupt chest compressions, perfusion pressure falls dramatically and remains very low until they resume compressions. Since coronary perfusion pressure measurements are not readily available during a resuscitation attempt, rescuers can monitor CPR quality with waveform capnography and intraarterial relaxation pressure. While feedback devices may improve the quality of CPR, they cannot be compulsory because their expense might limit their availability. Although not everybody has access to feedback devices, most of us will have access to capnography or capnometry. Measuring in tidal CO2 can be helpful in monitoring the quality of CPR. An in tidal CO2 of less than 10 like demonstrated in this picture here, is an indicator to improve the compressions. A rapid jump in the entitled CO2 may give us a clue about the return of spontaneous circulation. If you have access to entitled CO2, it's recommended that you utilize it for the duration of your pediatric resuscitation. The video in the corner of the screen is showing a number of monitoring traces for a patient. You will notice that there's a tracing in red and it's labeled ABP, so that's the arterial BP, which is invasive blood pressure monitoring with an arterial line. So another tool that we can use for monitoring the quality of CPR is looking at the A-line. An A-line must be present at the time of cardiac arrest, obviously, in order for us to use the A-line. Um, and this will either be a patient that's being monitored in ICU or a theatre setting, or if you're doing an inter-hospital transport uh, and the patient has got an A-line in situ already. The way to use the A-line is if the diastolic blood pressure, also known as the intra-arterial relaxation phase, is less than 20, this is an indicator to improve the quality of CPR. This picture is a printout of the raw data that was downloaded from a monitor um, from a real resuscitation. So it was a 44-year-old uh, male patient in an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, and the EMS um, had a physician on their team. Um, it's a physician-staffed EMS service. And they placed uh, the arterial line. So CPR was monitored with the A-line and the entitled CO2 tracing. And you can see that adrenaline was administered um, and uh, the patient was also defibrillated at various stages um, in the cardiac arrest. And you can also see that there are blood pressure changes recorded during the cardiac arrest because there's an A-line inside you. So the red line um, is showing the diastolic blood pressure. So that's the um, uh, intra-arterial relaxation phase that they're talking about. While you might not have a fancy feedback device or an A-line for the patient, pretty much all healthcare providers have access to smartphones. The cheapest tool to improve the quality of our CPR is to probably download a free metronome app. There are other apps, obviously, that I'm sure lots of you are aware of um, for real-time monitoring of CPR. Um, but a free metronome app is probably one of the easiest ways to make sure that we're doing um, adequate compressions at the correct rate. This slide shows the AHA BLS algorithm for children. The one on the left is for a single rescuer and the one on the right is for two or more rescuers. Um, the next video demonstrates the components of CPR in a child. To 
Today we're going to review BLS for the healthcare provider for the pediatric patient, for the child. Let's take a look at those skill steps now. First, establish unresponsiveness. Next, look for breathing for about five seconds. If this child is not breathing, immediately call a code, get some help coming. Now, in healthcare provider, two rescuer BLS for the child, our compression to ventilation ratio is 15 to two. You're going to provide 15 compressions, then provide two ventilations of air. We're still going to attach this child to an AED to see maybe if they are in a shockable rhythm. Let's take a look and see what those skills look like, shall we? Hey kid, you okay? This kid's unresponsive. He's not breathing. Nurse, call a code. Hey, this kid doesn't have a pulse. Hey, get over here with that AED. I'm starting compressions. Then go right to 15 to 2. Place electrodes. The AED's here. Place electrodes. Place electrodes. Do not touch patient. Analyzing rhythm. Do not touch patient. Analyzing rhythm. This is the South African BLS cardiac arrest algorithm. Um, that is much easier. It combines the BLS algorithm for CPR for adults and for children. And it also includes the ventilatory rates um, for a pediatric patient with a single rescuer or two-person rescue team. I personally prefer this BLS algorithm to the AHA ones um, because it's much less complicated. And obviously then we don't have to have a whole bunch of different algorithms. Um, it's all um, in one. The next video um, is to demonstrate the components of CPR in an infant. Welcome to today's video on healthcare provider BLS for the infant. Let's take a look at what those steps look like, shall we? Hey doc, Jeff. Who throws a baby? Step one, establish unresponsiveness. Two, assess for breathing. If this infant is not breathing, call a code immediately, get some help coming. You look cutie. And you're unresponsive. And you're not breathing. Nurse, call a code, I need some help in here. Next, check for a pulse. You know, check for no more than 10 seconds. If this infant does not have a pulse, immediately begin chest compressions. Check for a pulse. I got no pulse. Great. That's fantastic. My kingdom for two nurses right now. There goes my kingdom. I need you guys to take over CPR on this little one. You ready? Yes. Now in two rescuer CPR for the infant, the way we perform compressions is with a circumferential grip our thumbs on the sternum between the nipple line, and we're gonna compress about one-third the distance anterior posterior of this kid's chest. So almost halfway through this kid's chest, you're pushing. Again, at a rate over 100, and a compression to ventilation ratio of 15 to two. Okay, remember, we're gonna do our compressions 15 to two, 15 compressions, two breaths of air. Watch for that chest rise. This is a slide of the American Heart Association PULSE algorithm. This algorithm emphasizes the importance of hunting for reversible causes, all of the H's and T's. Probably the most important H's and T's in um, infants and children is hypoxia and hypovolemia. Depending on the setting, toxins also very well might be relevant. The anti-dysrhythmic medication of choice for pediatric patients is either amiodarone or lignocaine. The dose of amiodarone is five milligram, five milligrams per kg and can be repeated up to a total of three doses. Intravenous lignocaine may be used as an alternative to amiodarone with a loading dose of one milligram per kg. 
This algorithm emphasizes that medications can be administered via the intravenous or intraosseous route as they are equally acceptable. The main difference with the 2020 HA algorithm is for the timing of adrenaline, and this is also emphasized in the ILCOR guidelines. The initial dose of adrenaline must be given as soon as possible for children with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and non-shockable rhythms. The pediatric cardiac arrest algorithm emphasizes the early administration of adrenaline for asystole and PEA. By the cute little graphic of the adrenaline syringe um, in the algorithm as a cute memory aid. The most recent guidelines discuss in more detail the use of cuffed endotracheal tubes. So cuffed endotracheal tubes can be used over uncuffed ET tubes for intubating infants and children. But it's important that when you're putting in a cuffed ET tube that you've got to take note of the size of the ET tube and the position. Um, and it's really important to monitor cuff inflation pressures, which we need to keep usually between 20 to 25 centimeters of water. Although this is not a new recommendation, um, it has been uh, included in the recent guidelines, that cricoid pressure during intubation is not recommended routinely for endotracheal intubation of pediatric patients. Knowing your rhythms and rhythm recognition is vital during cardiac arrest. We need to be able to identify which rhythms are shockable and which are non-shockable. But it's probably really important to know that in pediatrics, most of the rhythms that we'll see are PEA and asystole. The patient might, um, at some stage during the cardiac arrest, develop a shockable rhythm. So for this reason, it's really important, even in infants, to drag out the defibrillator and the monitor and make sure that we're actually monitoring rhythms. Because if we're not looking for those shockable rhythms, we're never going to get to the stage where we can defibrillate the shockable rhythms. The 2020 guidelines recommend the use of AEDs in children. And if uh, an AED is available, also to use it for infants. Um, if we have got a manual defibrillator, it is preferable to use a manual defibrillator because then we can target the dose, the energy dose, um, for the child in front of us. So two to four joules per kg for defibrillation. So preferentially, we'd rather use a manual defibrillator because we can select the energy. The next best option would be to use an AED with a pediatric dose attenuator. And the last um, option would be to use an AED with adult pads. Um, I've come to the end of this particular talk.